Welcome to Peggy's Place. I'm Leanne Lindsay, your host today, and we'll be speaking via Zoom with Polina Krasikova. And I hope I said that correctly. Owner of the iconic restaurant Russian House Number no. One on Highway One, just south of Jenner, and perched high on a bluff overlooking the mouth of the Russian River, where it meets the Pacific Ocean right here on the Northern California coast. Today, we will talk not only about their unique approach to cooking, life, and community, but how these past months of COVID-19 have affected their business and, and their future. Welcome to Peggy's Place, Paulina. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's my uh, it's like big honor to be invited and talk to the community. Uh, well, I sure enjoyed stopping by your restaurant on the way back from my medical appointment in Santa Rosa. I had never actually stopped, and I've lived on the northern california coast for oh i don't know maybe 20 years <laughs> and i i was really impressed just the, with the uniqueness of the place and also the location it's so beautiful there but it's just a different style and approach that i've never seen before and and i thought that it was important for a lot of the listeners here on the Northern California coast to learn more about you, about the restaurant, about the others that are there with you in the restaurant, how you run it, but also what you guys are facing here during this pandemic. And why don't we first start with just a little introduction about yourself, uh, where you where you've hailed from in Russia, and what motivated you to make the transition to the States, and a little bit about the other people that work there with you. Yes, sure. Uh, and that's a unique story for sure. Like, and, and good morning, everybody. <laughs> so I'll, I'll try to like tell the secrets of Russian House. I believe like many of you have been here through the years with different experience, I believe, because this place has many angles. Uh, but uh, yes, I'll start about myself. Uh, well, I grew up in St. Petersburg, Russia. You know, that's a big city. One of the most beautiful cities in the world. Uh, like I, I've traveled a lot. I worked for the corporation. I'm an economist on my background. And uh, before our coming here, I was managing the company in mining equipment service business. So I was a director and 150 men reported to me. Say that again. I was a director for the company that serviced mining equipment. And I had 150 men reported to me. I had to be like a strong negotiator and leader and so on in all this, you know, business courses. But nevertheless, our, like uh, that my business career was for about like 15 years plus plus. And uh, so I experienced that something was missing in my life and it wasn't exactly the family, which would be normal. Uh, I was searching for something more meaningful and as many people I started to go like to yoga classes, meditation schools, read a lot of philosophical literature. I visited India like every my, uh, one of my vacations like Himalaya region like went there all around it. So did all these things that like the uh, spiritual beginners usually do. Like the Beatles did. <laughs> Well, yeah, I, I'm glad I'm in line with them. Uh, so, well, and finally, uh, I, I like did my conclusions from Hindu religion. And so what next? And by a chance, I got into some breathwork session. Just occasionally a friend invited me and it was so unique. I got a completely different experience. Like they say, like psychedelic type of experience with breathwork. And I started to Google it and who gives these curses in uh, St. Petersburg so I could continue to find out more about it. And so I found Tatiana Ginsburg, who is currently the main ideologist of Russian House. So I was truly impressed by the work she did in the breath work and the attention she pays to individual questions, individual search and how uh, effectively it, it comes uh, on the surface with her. So now, this I, is Tatiana, you said? Tatiana Ginsburg. Tatiana Ginsburg, she, she's, the, she, she should be, she's my co-founder, I would say main founder in Ideologies. I joined. Right, right. And you met her where again? In St. Petersburg, uh, where I came to attend her breathwork class. Got it, got it. 
Uh, so in uh, well, uh, since I started to attend her classes, uh, just continue my work and attend the classes. Uh, she gave me my birthday present once, and it was a Burning Man ticket. It was a what? Burning Man ticket, you know, Burning Man Festival in Nevada. Burning oh, Man. oh, the Burning Man Festival. The Burning Man. Yes, we, we know about that. Yeah, um, uh, I checked on the internet, I never heard about that. The craziest and all these negative people, you know, so what uh, it's like has to do with, you know, well. <laughs> But then uh, I thought, okay, different experience. And also, I never thought about United States as the vacation destination. For me, it was like true business. Just I, I would come to Chicago and New York and uh, Indianapolis, and it would be just negotiations and go, you know. I understand that. I used to work in the tech industry <laughs> for about 20 years. And when I travel internationally, it was almost always business. So I understand that. <laughs> yeah, and it did not sound like a vacation. So <laughs> that time I would like prefer to go to Himalayas as usual, but okay. So, so we went and it was my first time in California. And uh, we started with visiting different communities as Tatiana's interest is like as intentional communities. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so we were driving from LA to San Francisco uh, visiting those communities and staying in Esalen. And, you know, the Esalen is the creep of transpersonal psychology. And, well, right now they like more commercial than it used to be like in 60s and 70s and 80s. Much, much, much more commercial, but uh, still it was very special experience. And uh, the culmination of all of that was the Burning Man, this, all this um, completely different environment. I believe many people also experienced that it's like better to be than like hundred times to describe once. Uh, so it was special and it was like mind opening for me because I've seen like so many different people around that I've never seen for my whole life even traveling like to different countries. They were culturally different. And uh, the culture of acceptance of gift economy of self-expression stayed in the mind. and. It, in, in, in this state of mind, we were visiting Tatiana's friend closer to the coast. By chance, uh, founding out the Russian history here and uh, seeing the words Russian river in the middle of you know, nowhere almost was like more than burning man, you know. <laughs> it was, what? <laughs> what is that? Russian and, river and Russian also, river. yeah, the seven. Yeah. Where Russian river and the scenery, by the way, looks like Ural Mountains or some place in the middle of Russia. This Russian river that comes like right to my window right now. So it was unbelievable. It was a miracle. And very friendly uh, coastal uh, ranger explained us the history, gave us a booklet of Fort Ross, said go there. And uh, we went to Fort Ross, got there like after hours and uh, Hank, uh, the ranger there, he let us in, he showed us around after hours, and uh, we had still our Burning Man camper, and we parked on the beach right there. We did not know that it was prohibited. <laughs> so oh. we just camped on the beach at the Fort Ross and felt, well, this is the our land, like it's uh, Russia, like in California, in a good sense, it's motherland you know whatever it is like motherland earth it was like true uh, high impression and spirit and uh, in this spirit on the way back we saw that gloomy gray dusty indian restaurant on right on the bank of the river now before we get to that let's back up just a second to the rush the fort ross settlement Describe it a little bit for the listeners who may be listening in on the stream and they may not know what it looks like. Sure. Uh, so um, uh, in the beginning of 19th century, from uh, 1912 to 1945, the territory from around Badega Bay to, uh, let's say, the uh, Salt Point Park uh, belonged to Russian Empire. 
so those were the lands that supported the uh, Alaska territory that also belonged to Russian Empire. So that's uh, how big it was. Yeah, uh, I just learned something new. I didn't know it was all the way down from Bodega Bay to Salt Point Park. Yes, yes. I thought it was just that one section right there where it is today. Um, no, it was quite a territory. Somebody told me that the Russian settlements were even further just recently, like one historical, you know, expert came and said, you know, it, it was even further. <laughs> now, I did, I do remember studying it in college when I was at the College of San Mateo in uh, San Mateo County, south of San Francisco. We did cover that, and they, it probably, I'm sure they mentioned the extensive nature of it, but at that point, I wasn't living up this far up and so now i know what the, the the breadth of the distance and it's quite a bit of distance yes and especially it's amazing where the russian empire and the communication were a little different so are uh, yes so, uh, like a uh, russian ship came to san francisco first and uh, it was the remarkable love story that came out when the uh, head of uh, russian expedition uh, count and very noble man met young daughter of our Mexican governor of San Francisco fortress and they fall in love but she was Catholic and he was orthodox and he was on duty on mission so he had to go back and ask emperor to for the permission to their marriage and all the way uh, on the way uh, he went he made it back to St. Petersburg uh, they made an agreement of uh, making the settlement of Fort Ross, so Mexicans like didn't have um, uh, like a problem. Is that it wasn't Mexico, Spanish, you know, all, all this history. Um, but on the way back, uh, riding his horse through Siberia to take a boat on the Pacific shore of Russia, uh, this uh, count he got sick and died, and his young bride Conchita waited for him all her life. And her grave is here, like near San Francisco. She always believed that she was alive. She waited for him all her life. So that's a remarkable story. What a story. Yes. What a heartbreaking story. And you know, our, like it's, it's a little bit off, uh, but one of the wonderful person we met is our, the grand, grand, grand daughter of that count. She came here to Russian house because that count was married before the ex expedition. He had uh, children from his first marriage, his uh, former wife died. And this old lady, she came, yes, I'm Rizanov. Wow. Oh, hi, Rizanov. I'm like, uh, like, yeah, grand, grand, grand. And this remarkable old lady, she baked the bread in our place. And she's traveled the world on yacht with five children she had. What an experience to meet someone like that. What a tie in to history after all these years. <laughs> it's absolutely some miracles, this human, wonderful human nature that continues through the years, through the ages. And Fort Ross uh, developed into quite a settlement with the fortress in the center. It's where it is now. It's called Fort Ross. No other name to explain. In kind of midway, like between. I took my young son once. He was probably around eight years old on a tour through Fort Ross and saw all the, you know, the, the, the implements that they use, the tools <clears throat> for their trades, and all the different buildings surrounding the fort. It's really an interesting place to go and, and tour to get a little slice of history. And so go on, you were talking about it. Yes, yes, so the, the Fort Ross itself is unique because I mean, at, at all uh, United States don't have such an old buildings and settlements, like a lot of them, you know, it's a 200 years old uh, settlement and especially how it's being kept. The people that work there love that place and you can tell it. It's not just a dusty museum like which died like uh, like long long ago. It's right, and they have an annual festival that I've been meaning to go to. That uh, they do all kinds of events throughout the day. It just sounds like a really wonderful thing to do. <laughs> yes, and it's another anecdote, by the way, cultural. So they are on that festival. We participate every year, like. Um, 
will be here with the food. And so they did uh, the um, sceneries of old Russian crafts. And all of that Russian, uh, one of that crafts was welding. And uh, in Russia, welder is usually uh, in the culture uh, somebody who is a strong man only, and that's almost a name for somebody for for some for um, handsome man. And uh, so Russian television was going to make a film about Fort Ross and what's happening. And they said, "Okay, we'll tell you this uh, Russian crafts." And uh, like uh, Russian television was shocked when the welder at Fort Ross was like tiny American woman. <laughs> What a juxtaposition that was. <laughs> and, they, yes, and this woman told me the story in Russian store. I met her and she was telling me the story. You know, I was doing my best. I was preparing. And then when they saw me, they said, no. Aww. Look gloomy and turned away. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> for me, it was so funny. You know, I understood. But, you know, it's a cultural difference. <laughs> True, true. Well, you know, people have a vision of what a blacksmith is supposed to look like, uh, or a horseshoer, you know, they expect someone big and burly like that. So what did happen? Did they, did, so did she, she obviously did not get that position, somebody she else. Got, <laughs> she didn't get filled. <laughs> Poor lady. Discrimination. <laughs> I mean, you see, it wasn't a discrimination. In our culture, it's still, um, I don't know, it's a uh, woman, uh, like in a better sense, sh shall be like doing different things, you know, not because it's not appropriate, but because it's hard somehow. And here you come from a background where you worked in a mining company with lots of men. So that must have been, you could re relate. Well, it was nice to be a woman there. You know, I could play both, both sides. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, when was it that you first visited Fort Ross? How many years ago was that? It was 2014. It was uh, August 2014 when we first visited Fort Ross, when we found this uh, Indian restaurant on the way, and we um, first asked the family uh, who ran that place. It was an Indian family, which is also remarkable because before I like went to India all the time. So that's kind right. of easy, yeah, giving, giving the entrance to something new. Uh, so they said, you know what, we are tired, we live in Santa Rosa, we go forth and back every day, we like so tired, yes, we want to sell it. Uh, so uh, it was uh, September, early September, and I was back um, in November already to come here and find out more details. I met the landlord that time, and it was initial negotiations, and then just being bored on one of the meetings online, so I registered a corporation in the United States. It was so easy, you know, just $300 and I had a corporation in the US. It was <laughs> it's also something, you know, my own opening. And, uh, you know, the next time having a corporation, you know, we came with Tatiana already to open an account and start an escrow deal with, uh, to, to purchase this business. Well, if you're just tuning in, you're listening to KGUA 88.3 FM here on the Northern California coast. I'm Leanne Lindsay, your host today on Peggy's Place, and we have been talking with Polina Krasikova. I hope that is, pre please uh, correct me if that's a different way that's of right. pronouncing. <laughs> and she's one of the owners of Russian House Number no. 1, located just south of Jenner, up on the bluffs overlooking the mouth of the Russian River, where it meets the Pacific Ocean. Quite the location you found there. It's, uh, and, you, and you were just telling us how you first came across it, and then you met the landlord, and, and so take it from there, Paulina. Uh, yes, so um, we did the negotiations, uh, so this building is being owned by an um, American family who uh, inherited it from their parents, and their parents like um, bought uh, some time ago several uh, land spots around on the coast, and they also are own the bridge heaven, which is across the road from us. Uh, but our, we bought the business uh, with the right for lease uh, from Indian family who was here before for some time also, right. several years. Uh, 
so it all happened quite fast. And so first uh, coming with this idea in August 2014, already in May 2015, Tatiana and I uh, and two of our friends came to open the restaurant. Uh, well, um, we got it in a like very kind of gloomy condition. Uh, so people who were here before, they didn't like it, so they didn't care. And when you in restaurant business, uh, especially you know that, you know, like negligence for a little time and already, you know, a lot of things broken and it's really hard to clean them and uh, fix them. So we had a lot of like two months of constant cleaning and fixing and repairing and painting and um, uh, started to involve the, uh, our friends and community because even to hire a cleaner in this area is pretty hard. There just, there are no it's people true. around here. We're very remote, our location, especially you guys down there. Uh, from where we are, we're, we're remote too. It's hard for restaurants to find workers. And I have a good friend who's a chef here and she was working at the Sea Ranch Lodge. She had come in from uh, Chico where she owned a very famous restaurant over there called Spice Creek Cafe. And it's Rebecca Stewart. And she's always told me how difficult it is to find, you know, good workers or, you know, dependable workers here. We're so remote. So you you came across the same thing. Yes, absolutely. Yes, even for, for money, it was hard to find. So actually, uh, around that time, we started to develop the idea that uh, uh, became our one of the core ones in Russian house. So we started to think, you know, how to make this a cultural place in the, this caravansaray, the Burning Man topic, theme which became was caravansaray. You know, this is the guest house in, uh, in Asia. This is the name for guest house in Asia, uh, which would be located on the main roads. We would our uh, merchandisers and philosophers and traveling artists would come together, gather and discuss, you know, and the same culture is in Russia. So people come to uh, talk, uh, to meet each other and food is separate. It can be minor food, no food, you know, a lot of food like in Asia, a lot, 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 lot of food, you know, different, but it's like, home, you know, it's happening, it's not necessary, not required. So how to give this spirit, you know, uh, to, to this place? And uh, Tatiana and her husband, uh, they came out with the idea um, of, uh, okay, let's don't charge them. You know, well, all these rules, you know, how, how are you table for two menu? Uh, Bill, uh, tips, tips required, if no tip, then you like something wrong, you know, in Europe and in Russia, uh, you know, wages and prices are enough, you know, so tip, tip is only extra when you're absolutely happy. And here is the tax for uh, customer, you know, your obligatory paying tip. That's true. Otherwise, That's why. owners, yes, don't, don't pay a reasonable salary, which is, I think, like, a, I don't like this system, let's say. So that is the first difference I noticed when I sat down to talk with you. And you mentioned the fact that you pay what you feel it's worth. So mm -hmm. that's such a different approach than you're right. I mean, here it's like tip is obligatory and uh, your approach is completely different. Yes, so we decided, okay, include everything like in, in a price and pay and when like so, so like it would break this our uh, standard borders between like uh, customer let's say and servant from the other side whatever it is you know so we wanted to change it right from the entrance and so that was challenging and with my former marketing background I actually i supported it from this beginning because it's very big distinction immediate distinction it's risky yes because the bills in california with the rent and taxes and you know produce and utilities is high uh, so in the beginning uh, i uh, spent all my savings to support support this idea and paying just from my pocket to let this you know but it's, it happens in many businesses when uh, owners in this there True. but nevertheless uh, we did invest it into this idea and in about four months it started to restaurant started to pay its bills for itself 
uh, it was challenging from another side, which uh, we didn't expect much because charity type organizations are uh, well known in California and people thought we would be another charity organization. And it's not, it's our system wasn't about that. Our system was about contribution and supporting and creating something in, in common. We couldn't, you know, pay for people from our pocket <laughs> all the time. So it, it, it it's, uh, was constant um, uh, exercise, uh, constant challenge for communication, how to uh, give this idea properly. So it's not us being used by people who just want like cheap food. Right. Um, but uh, involve people. Um, you really believe... do pull people in and get them to be like a community, wherever yeah. they're coming from, because this is a popular road, Highway 1 up the coast of California, as people are traveling either north or south, uh, there are going to be a lot of different types of people that are going to come into your restaurant. And yet you've created a theme or a way to weave in the conversations and bring people together. Yes, exactly. Uh, well, uh, so uh, coming back, like the core is three uh, girls like from Russia who are the main core and then the volunteers I'll tell you briefly about. So that's uh, me, uh, Tatiana Ginsburg. Tatiana Ginsburg, she's a transpersonal psychologist, PhD, and she was in human potential development all her life. So, uh, she uh, would see this place as an environment for development where people would uh, see something different, you know, besides our uh, like initial payment and restaurant concept. So something that would, you know, make a shift, you know, things can be different. And some people like it, some people don't. And it's uh, so it can be different reaction. And it's also, of course, us and um, uh, how we approach because we also are not robots, we people. And sometimes, you know, also can get tired and unfortunately maybe didn't like uh, pay enough attention to some details, somebody who would come. It happens sometimes and I'm sorry for that. Uh, but in, in majorly we tried to create the atmospheres that would be inviting and challenging the same time. <laughs> and, and, you, and you, all three of you created something that you're passionate about and you are happy to share it with others. And that's what I found very appealing when I first walked in and was thinking about how you all came together to create this you know, very unique environment. And just to describe for our listeners as they enter into your restaurant, what they, what they see, I mean, now, we, you've been closed during COVID-19 days, but then open to do takeout. But what do they see you know, before you were shut down? They'd walk in and then what would they see and experience? Yes, well, so uh, just briefly, but the third girl who was here and whom probably uh, like many people uh, met because she was here for a long time, uh, Tanya Urusova, she is a younger girl from Russia. She is architect on her education and she was in, uh, model casting business uh, on internet, completely different thing. And she was uh, uh, brought here also by the idea of changing her life is something more meaningful. So Tanya uh, was here for the long time taking care of the restaurant. And I believe like many people remember her as a face of Russian house. I'm glad you mentioned that. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, yes, sir. Uh, in normal times, there would be a buffet with food we would cook for the day, um, and people would help themselves. Uh, we would try to talk to them, try to involve them in a conversation as much as we and they were ready and were willing to. You know, some people just wanted a quick snack and go, like we wouldn't bother them too much. And somebody wanted to ask questions. So like, oh, sir, we always had puzzles initial you know our level puzzles riddles and stories on the tables that people could start to involve their mind uh, also and ask questions we have describe some of those puzzles because i found those intriguing too and i bought one from you for, for my son he doesn't know it yet but <laughs> tell us a little bit about the background of those puzzles 
Yeah. Not, not like many, you know, heart opening spiritual school. We believe that mind is very important. So uh, we pay a lot of attention to self-observation, self-reflection, and noticing the change in us in an environment. And we believe that puzzles is the very important tool to start seeing differences and find the different creativity path. You know this. Uh, and uh, our, we have a big collection of puzzles, uh, most of them made in Russia. Uh, Tatiana and her husband Gennady collected them for many years and pre produced them in Russia. Uh, it's, uh, and, and you have the books that you opened up and you showed me all the history of those puzzles and, and how they break down and how to put them back together. And it's a extensive information that you've got there that talks about the, the history. Yep. I hope your son uh, could solve that puzzle without him. <laughs> oh, you will oh, me, be. Too. <laughs> me too. <laughs> oh, but uh, I did take pictures of the book like you suggested, and so I'm going to make sure that he gets that information along with it. But um, I, they're really beautiful. They're all, they look all handcrafted. They're not like... They are, they are handcrafted. They are handcrafted. And uh, each uh, of uh, last three years, each uh, two weeks of June, we would be part of Art at the Source by Sebastopol Art Center, uh, showing the, doing the puzzle exhibition involving people to play. Uh, right now, it's also beginning of June, and I have puzzles for exposition. Because of the COVID, uh, it's not possible to do a proper event, but still, you know, with self-isolation, you can come and try and, and uh, look at our puzzles. Maybe I'll give you to solve one. <laughs> <laughs> um, go ahead. You wanted to say something. Yes, but with the puzzles also, like, you know, it's uh, they are beautiful. They are handmade and they have... Uh, different uh, techniques to solve. But what we practiced here, like regarding to human potential, uh, it's the approach to solving the puzzle. Because uh, it's first one, people, everybody, me too, if we, we try obvious, you know, obvious, and obvious doesn't work. Wow. And then most of the people experience frustration. No, I don't want to. Where is the solution? And some people who like really precious customers, you have to show me like how to solve it. It shall be instruction. <laughs> instructions. Because that's important. That's why we are for here. Overcoming. Overcoming frontier. And, uh, you know, seeing uh, the sol solving an instruction doesn't help. You'll forget it. I did it myself. I would look in the internet. Do it, okay, lose the interest into this puzzle, and that's it. No, no use for me, except like, uh, like short-time curiosity. But if to overcome this frustration, first, it's an exercise for the character. Second, like really opening a new like passage into your brain. And you know, that's how the creative uh, solutions are found. It's, so we, it's, a re it, it's really a reflection of life. I mean, we are constantly faced as we uh, grow and age and, and live our lives. We're going to come across hurdles that we've got to get past and get through. And the solution's not always obvious at the beginning of how we're going to do that. And uh, we're living in a major time like that right now. <laughs> Absolutely, yes, yes. So these yeah. little things can act like be an exercise, like to solve something bigger. That's exactly how we see it. Yes, and so we've talked now with, uh, and I'm going to let our listeners again know that we're talking with Paulina Krasikova, one of the owners of Russian House Number no. One just south of Jenner on the cliffs overlooking the ocean and the Russian River, the mouth of the Russian River, as it snakes its way back through Sonoma County. And I'm Leanne Lindsay. This is KGUA 88.3 FM in Wallala, California, further up north from them, about an hour, 20 minutes so, or 15 minutes up the coast from where they are. And you can hear us on the stream at kgua.org, on apps Radio Garden and TuneIn, and on RadioFreeAmerica.com. So we are streaming around the world, and we are just uh, enjoying a conversation with Paulina about 
where she came from, how she came together with the others there at the restaurant, how they, how she found her way north to the Northern California coast. And the challenges I'd like to kind of get into right now of what you've been through. Uh, and then we, I'd like to even talk recipes. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, first, let's, since we're talking about challenges in life, uh, you know, when, when COVID-19 rose in the news and all the changes happened and then we all had to shelter in place and and all businesses had to really come to a grinding halt what happened there at your place and what uh, what changes is this bringing about for you guys so when uh, uh the COVID started to happen i was actually in russia i went uh, after the new years uh, to st petersburg and i was there and i was watching the tv news because the uh, virus came to united states earlier than russia i'm still surprised how it happened because we have an extended border with china but uh, like Italy was going crazy and like United States started to experience a severe... Well, a lot of the travelers... But no had, in Russia. Right. Was, well, a lot of the travelers had gone from China to Europe and then from Europe into the United States. So that's how it hit here so hard. Possibly, possibly. Or maybe Russia closed the border somehow very early with China. I don't know what happened, but somehow. So uh, I made the decision uh, to fly to California just before the border was closed with the U.S. Okay. Like, almost the last week, uh, they were international flights. It was the end of March. That must have been something traveling during that time, first of all. Uh, yeah, well, really knowing it, what the situation is. Absolutely. I was not sure like how the borders work, but it was actually, in fact, good time to fly because like few people on the plane. Uh, I, I went to New York and New York airport was empty. Um, Which so I've people... flown through New York airport so many times and that's just hard to even envision. Yeah, so it was like line took, I don't know, 10 minutes and that's it. Welcome to United States. So basically for the last two months, I am uh, pretty much alone here, um, obeying the quarantine, but uh, almost right from the beginning, I started to think how to change the format. So we used to do a buffet. Uh, so it's less time for obviously for serving, uh, but uh, I, I choose the uh, menu and the proper recipes that easier to cook fast and uh, deliver in a box or paper cup, paper plate. Uh, and again, yes, it's additional expense, it's additional type of serving, but nevertheless, I kind of moved our buffet from, from buffet, like uh, our heaters to the kitchen. So like soup is always ready when anyone comes. And then uh, like we never did dumplings before, and, you know, it's like tasty Russian ravioli. It's uh, in the, from the buffet, they would disappear at the, the one moment, so we never did them. <laughs> <laughs> but when the amount is controlled by us, so I started to do that because it's just five, six minutes to boil them in the water and do a little sauce on side. So that were really popular in the first months of quarantine. And then uh, I like to do uh, Russian pancakes, very thin crepes with uh, poppy seed um, in, in them. So it's all natural uh, mix. And, uh, you know, I became so popular with this, so let's say, menu that uh, people from Bay Area come specially. And uh, considering the recipes and food, food we cooked, so we uh, printed a cookbook of Russian house of the recipes collected by us, uh, changed to local produce, updated, like uh, Americans don't eat buckwheat much. You know, this is Russian grain, no gluten-free, really healthy, very good for diabetics, very popular in Russia. But Americans just don't know and don't, don't eat it. So I've developed personally more than 10 recipes with buckwheat. So, and now like people like it, so they, they would come back. So it was hard really to develop a menu because we wanted to do our best according to season. Uh, and uh, according to what people like and it, also considering us like today I feel like uh, nice vegetables you know or 
uh, it was happened that somebody like farmers sometimes brought us like the lamp. So we've collected like uh, about 100 recipes that we included in our book and it's available also to purchase here or before we would invite people to cook with us in the kitchen and share. So like that, we got a great French chef, Nicholas, and I like learned a lot from him and he cooked, you know. So we got a very nice woman, Eileen, she's Turkish and she cooked Turkish food. We had uh, uh, an older Indian couple who cooked Indian food. Uh, Chinese woman stayed with us for the breathwork retreat and she cooked Chinese food, explaining the elements around. So like these people would come to Russian house and stay to help and participate. So they could participate in the kitchen with the recipes. Uh, like the Auckland young guys, you know, they look a little different. They would like, they always hungry, want to eat and don't have a lot of money. So we always would have some work for them to like, to do an extra to whatever they could to pay, like uh, clean, wash dishes, you know. All, the, all guests were invited to wash their dishes, by the way. So they feel more like at home, not like consumers sitting mm -hmm. and waiting. I cook the food, uh, which is, I, I feel appropriate for the day and ingredients available. And also, uh, you know, uh, like really uh, Russian cuisine sometimes, it's cooked for long, long, long time. So we had to update and change those recipes. Right now we allow to serve people uh, outside and we have patio, but uh, again, the requirements for maintaining this outside seating is quite extended. And uh, so that's gloves, masks, and uh, changing and sterilizing after everyone and sterilizing bathrooms. Uh, so. Uh, I, 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 I think I'm not going to do it like on a normal way since I, I just can't like cook, meet people and sterilize after each one. So I think maybe uh, I'll do it by like reservation or request and otherwise, uh, unfortunately, we'll have to work um, for takeouts. Now, currently, let's move on to the situation with the lease. Now, you you had been informed by the landlord that the lease after five years of being there that you were going to have to move out by the end of this month was it june 30th well uh, so uh we signed in 2015 five years uh lease with uh the right to extend and we sent a uh, letter our intention to extend in time we always paid in time and um, our landlord did not give us any significant reasons for rejection but nevertheless, they, they sent us a rejection to renew. Uh, so we were like really upset about it and being philosophical, we were thinking, so, okay, maybe it's like a time to renew, time to move, time to open something new, you know, since we are not like strict. But uh, lately, uh, like we sent a petition in, in community. So if you want Russian house to stay, like please support and so we got over 1200 signatures supporting us that's quite a bit 1200 in this remote area is quite a bit and it's all it's uh, like local communities and it's russian community also mm -hmm. because you know uh, it's easy to say okay move to other location but also like the angle for this we are russian center and there is no more appropriate place for russian center Honestly, where else? It's a Russian river, like used form a Russian territory. And you know, being us in Greenville, it's a would be change of format without this flavor, or like any other place. In San Francisco, possible to do some type of philosophical cafe, I thought. But it's also it's not that. It's not that caravan sarai that I was talking about. Some place for traveler, welcoming place for traveler to get warm, get food and talk. It makes a lot of sense. Uh, Russian house number one on the Russian River near Fort Ross, the you know uh, the former Russian fort. And in fact, when I was there at your place that day, there was a traveler who had come in from San Francisco because the protest had shut their business down. So he wanted to see Fort Ross. Mm -hmm. And he stumbled across your restaurant and I believe he had Russian heritage even. So it, it makes sense, your location and the, and the people that you come across there. Yeah, we were always in partnership with Fort Ross. Fort Ross is a history. 
And we try to represent the modern Russia. Modern Russia is eclectic. And so like we are not traditional, traditional village style, whatever. So we try to represent different, different angles. And we have even Putin on a chocolate portrait. You know, people say, oh, you like Putin, you know. We, we, or, or sometimes we had communist flag, you know. Oh, you communist. We integrate everything. We are not rejecting. We are uniting. You know, even this, this contradictive stuff. Right. Because we are like attached to that. But it's a part of history. That's something to talk about. Something, you know, if wisely reconsider. Not to reject immediately. Because I believe that is a true democracy. To look yes. at the things from different perspectives and see what's there and what can be there in a harmonic way, like, and maybe right here, right now. Try to have an open mind, in other words, mm -hmm. and, and to be open to other ideas. Mm -hmm. So I would like to know now, since you've done the petition, is the landlord reconsidering the possibility of extending? Okay, first of all, uh, thank you very much, whoever signed it, maybe among our listeners, there are those people. Yes. And, uh, we are going to send an update. So right now, we are send this petition to our landlord, uh, together with the letter. So yes, we are ready for the peaceful negotiation still, but uh, they are not responding for more than a week right now. So the next case, I believe, like uh, we're still thinking about this. If our uh, legal advisor, who is also a volunteer, but very good legal advisor, uh, says that we shall file a case still in the court because uh, this is like, there are signs of uh, discrimination, unfortunately, because there are no like real reasons. And so it's not just commercial deal. We are ready for the like lease, uh, even if it's like extremely hard right now, like, you know, landlords give discounts, not increasing the rents right now, but we are not rejecting. We wanted to negotiate because come on, you know, in this situation, how like to pay? Well, so uh, for me, it's a, like a tough decision, but my, my friends, Tatiana, they do support like, and they, they all think that it's not fair to just, you know, we, we are not, uh, initial investment was even quite significant. If you think on a business level, it's not, honest just to kick us out, you know, and on a human level, I believe we want to do more for community, not Russian community and local community. There right. is no other place like us. You know, there are other restaurants. If you don't like our concept, not, not comfortable, well, we are the only one, you know, all others are the same, just, you know, we are something unique. And uh, I, I believe we're worth saving. Definitely unique, uh, a reflection of so many different ideas and culture and and the way that you have been there for five years thriving as a, as a business that hopefully they will con reconsider, but taking legal steps is also an important thing to do during this time. And you also have to have plans B, C, and D lined up in case, you mm -hmm. know, the first couple of approaches don't work. So, or I should say C, D, and E, since you are working <laughs> on A and B. <laughs> well, yeah, uh, I thought about like different places, like a city type of cafe with the discussion, but um, right now it's hard to say with the protest and quarantine where it's possible. Also, we thought about retreat space on the nature, maybe like in Sonoma County, in Mendocino County, so people would gather for more like practices. It's popular in California, you know, like um, many centers like south of Bay Area, like on the northern of Bay Area, it could be something like that. You know, but Very, it, yes. it would, would be someone who would share this idea and we could do it together because I don't have initial investment anymore. Well, retreats are very popular uh, here in Northern California, and I could see you being successful at that with a, your such a unique approach. And the people that you have, like Tatiana and her background it is extensive. Yeah. And they, you know, an investor would be getting that kind of experience and history with a group of, if you all wanted to still stay together, that is. But yeah, if, uh, if someone would uh, like, like to partner with us and discuss it, welcome, definitely. 
Uh, well, this place has uh, you know, happened as a lot of synchronicities. So I believe that the next one shall be also something that that just comes together naturally, not forced, you know, not business business type. But that's what I also liked about when I t sat there and talked with you that day. That I on my way back home it was how you really approached this business and it developed organically. It wasn't a forced thing. And mm -hmm. that, that's uh, sometimes being able to go with that kind of direction takes a leap of faith for one thing, but also it allows for even perhaps even better things to happen. Exactly, yes. So that's how you got into that. So many miracles happen, so many kindness of people. You know, uh, just uh, yesterday, like one woman, came from San Francisco with her red fat cat. And she said, you know, let cat go around the room. This is for your good luck. Oh. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and uh, well, it's simple glance, you know, and the musicians who would play the piano and uh, girl from Oakland who painted the trailer, the, the Russian art cow on there. And uh, so many, you know, heart and kind investments for that place. I so love I the photos so of the musicians from your website. And when I shared it on our, on our Facebook page, we've gotten so many comments from people who are saying how much they love seeing the music, the location, the view from your restaurant. Uh, it's, it's pretty popular. I was surprised at the feedback we got on Facebook. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and black African guy just came on the uh, midst of protest in San Francisco. He was what protest? He sat and, and taught me how to play the piano of the song he wrote. And this is something, you know, for me, like politics is always politics. We Russians skeptical and maybe cynical, you know, politics, always politics. And miracles happen from human being to human being. And right here, right now, not like some, you know, uncle, somebody, you know, Putin, whatever. Whoever, you know, is going to give it to us. We, music we music brings us together. Music and food. Music brings us together. And we are responsible for creating this, you know, harmonious moment. We are. I am. <laughs> you know, not someone whom you're going to, like, call or protest or whatever. This is, like, all our history shows it. Well, let's hope you can get back to a day where you've got more music in there that you were able to stay there and continue what you have been doing all these years with the volunteers and the, you know, serving the traveling community that goes up and down Highway 1. Uh, before we get to the end of our show, which is coming up very soon here, could you tell us a little bit more about some of the volunteers and perhaps some of the visitors that you've seen over the years? Oh, that's a huge list. Yesterday, I started to look oh. at the names and couldn't like choose who was the most remarkable. Among the visitors, like who surprised me was Russian Tsar. Yes, the nephew, the nephew of Nicholas II, the last Russian Tsar, lives in Point Race. No way. His name is Prince Andrew. He oh, he's, I think he's I've heard of that. himself with his wife visited us and sat with me on this table. You know, he is like 86 or 87 somehow years old, but that was a uh, quite a surprise. <laughs> I bet. I bet. Yes. The so, son of a czar. Now was he uh, what's his name again? Uh Prince Andrew. Andrew. Andre. 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 All right, and some of the others? Uh, well, so among our guests, few beautiful speakers on our lectures, like Stuart Hamerov, a uh, famous neurobiologist, uh, and our um, Julia Mosbridge, uh, the expert on artificial intelligence. Uh, then uh, we had a couple great musicians, like uh, Stuart Rabinovich, the local piano doctor and musician who used to uh, organize open mic. Steven Priputnevich was here many times. Um, then uh, lately, I loved uh, musicians, local musicians that Mia Roth, our neighbor, would brought together, like beautiful young guys who performed like incredible music. Like, thank you very much, Mia, if you hear me. <laughs> 
like well, and, and more and more and more and volunteers, you know what also, you know, we have two are very special old gentlemen, uh, Jeff and Bruce, our neighbors. He's, he, they've been coming here for three years, just two maybe times per week, just help, you know, feeling that it's meaningful. Jeff to, the, does the gardening. Uh, Bruce likes to watch the place and always checking if everything all right, if everything well kept, and it's so touchy. And... That's what I like about working at this public radio station too. You know, the, we feel passionate about helping out and making sure whatever needs to be done gets done. I mean, it's not just one task. We've got a variety of tasks to keep this station going. So I understand and I can relate to that. Now, if people would like to help with your um, quest to remain there and to, is there a way that they can uh, also participate in this petition to the landlord or is there anything that our listeners could do to help? Uh, absolutely, there are certain ways uh, to help. Well, if you have any suggestions and advices and uh, welcomings, like for whatever, from culinary to spiritual range. Uh, our uh, email is russianhouse1 at gmail.com. It's one word. And everything is Russian uh, House 1. Our website is Russian House 1. It's easy to Google it. Our Facebook is Russian House 1. It's also easy to find it with all the updates. On our Facebook page and our website, there are links. Uh, one for the petition. You can follow the link at Change York. You signed it, and our landlord immediately gets your request, as well as us. Uh, and uh, the second link is on GoFundMe campaign. Is if you're willing to make a donation uh, or for like helping us during this period or for the further endeavors. So welcome also. I would be like really thankful if you could put. So the link for your GoFundMe page is on your Facebook now, page. On our Facebook page, you please scroll it down. Uh, maybe it went a little down now because we had later posts. Uh, uh, and definitely there. so everything is Russian House 1, Russian House 1 at gmail.com, Russian House 1 at Facebook. And you mentioned something else, but in website, addition. Website, uh, Russian the website. That, that com is... Uh, Mm -hmm. And what is the telephone number there in case someone wants to call and talk with you guys Seven or, or, or make an order? <laughs> sure. 707-865-9456. Uh, Let me check somehow when I... Uh... Okay. <laughs> this has uh, been Paulina Krasikova, and she's one of the owners of Russian House One, just south of Jenner. And now we've got her back here at the Zoom call and she's gonna give us the telephone number again. Yes, 707-865-9456. Uh, Say that one more time. 707-865-9456. Uh, Thank you, Paulina. I really enjoyed having you as a guest today here on Peggy's Place. And I really wish you guys well. Uh, I, I, I'm glad that you were able to come on this uh, the show this morning and talk with us. And um, is there any last words that you wanted to say? Thank you very much. I'm pleased to participate. I love the community and uh, I hope we'll stay here and see our friends like more and more in Russian house. Thank you again. And I hope so too. Take care, Paulina. You too. Bye -bye. You're listening to KGUA 88.3 FM in Wallala, your public media station for the Redwood Coast.